Well, we're in part three of this series that we've been journeying through the book of Esther. This is a 10-chapter section, a 10-chapter book in the Old Testament, and we're on week three. And, and I thought in order to put us all on the same page, I'm going to do what's never been attempted before, to summarize four chapters in the Bible in under four minutes. Do you think I can do it? Oh, I'm going to give it a shot. Okay, here we go. With my help from our friends at the Bible Project, I give you four chapters in under four minutes. Go. So, the book of Esther. It's this exciting, curious book in the Bible. The story is over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from the land uh, where some Jews did return to Jerusalem. Remember Ezra and Nehemiah? But many did not. Now, the book of Esther is about this Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of ancient Persian Empire. And the characters in the story are two Jews, Mordecai and his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in the story. And then there's this Persian official. His name is Haman, the cunning villain. Now, this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never mentioned. Now, this is a brilliant technique by the author, who is anonymous, by the way, but it's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity. And there are signs of it everywhere. The story is filled with these odd coincidences and these ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but from behind the scenes. So let's dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing an elaborate banquet that lasts a total of 187 days, and it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands his wife, Queen Vashti, to appear at the party and show off her beauty. She refuses. And so, in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti, makes a decree that all Persian men should now be masters of their own homes. Then, he holds this beauty pageant because he actually wants a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. Um, we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Now, Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant, wins, and the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Soon after, and even more serendipitous is the fact that Mordecai, Esther's uncle, just happens to overhear that two royal guards are plotting to murder the king, so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king. Mordecai gets credit for saving the king, and right here from the very beginning, this seems providentially ordered. Okay, now, let me introduce you to this character, Haman. He's not Persian. Doug taught us last week he's an Agagite, which is an ancient descendant uh, of the Canaanites. Okay, so the king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before him. Mordecai sees him. He refuses to kneel, which, of course, fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai is Jewish, this isn't good. Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to dis destroy all the Jewish people and to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation. He literally rolls dice. 11 months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die, and Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. Okay, so now, turns to Mordecai and Esther. Who are the only hope for the Jewish people and they make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse this decree. But, but Doug taught us that approaching the king without a royal request, according to Persian law, is an act that is worthy of death. But Mordecai is confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from some other place. And Mordecai wonders aloud, he says, who knows, maybe you've become queen for such a time as this. Esther responds with bravery and she proposes to go to the queen, king with these amazing words, if I perish, then I perish. And that, my friends, is four chapters at right four minutes. You know, we talk about this as a story. In fact, I, I would propose that this is one of the greatest stories in all of scripture, and I think you'll agree with me by the time we get to the end of this series that it truly is one of the greatest stories. But I wonder, like when you think about great stories like this one, 
what is it that makes a story great? Like for real, when you think about all of your favorite movies, whether it's Star Wars or Lord of the Ring or Home Alone, what makes all of these stories so compelling? Well, I want to say that before I get started, I'm deeply indebted in this talk to the author John Ortberg, as well as an author named Robert McKee who wrote a book called Story. And it's in this book that Robert McKay lays out the idea of every great story. He basically says, look, every great story is simply about a person, a character, a protagonist that has an object of desire, something that they really, really want. Sort of if you laid out a visual of what it looks like, it sort of looks like this. And there's all kinds of things that are happening in any great story, right? There's conflict, interpersonal things are going on, and then there's risks that you have to take. But if you break down the spine of every story you really love, it's always about somebody who's willing to do whatever it takes to accomplish the thing that they want, right? Their greatest heart's desire. This is every great story from Lord of the Rings to the Wizard of Oz. It is about a character who really decides what they want and they pursue it with all they have. Well, this holds true in the book of Esther. And in the two chapters we're going to dive into, we're going to see two diverging stories. Two people who have different heart's desires and are literally willing to do whatever it takes to achieve these desires. Now, the two characters, first is the uh, book's namesake, Esther. And Esther is this new queen of Persia. And as I had set up and Doug taught last week, where we left off was she had decided that she was gonna do whatever it took to save her people, right? And so if she goes to the king and she perishes, she says, I will perish. But my heart's desire is to do whatever it takes to save my people, to do the right thing. And so in Esther chapter 5 and verse 1, it says that Esther puts on a robe and she gets ready. She goes to the inner court of the palace and in front of the king's hall and the king was sitting on his royal throne and when he saw Queen Esther standing at the court, this is a moment of truth. He was pleased with her and he extended his golden scepter, which means she could come forward. So she comes forward and the king says, what is it? What is it that you desire? And I love this. He says, what is it that you desire? And he then offers her what honestly for most of us would be a pretty great thing to have. He says, what do you want? Half the kingdom? What do you want? You want half the kingdom? I'll give it to you. And she says this, she says, in verse four, if it pleases the king, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for you. She says, remember, she put together a plan, her and Mordecai, she is, her heart's desire is to save her, her people. And part of the plan was to come to the banquet. So we pick up in verse five and it says, so the king and Haman went to the banquet. Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, now, what is your petition? What is your heart's desire, Esther? And it will be given to you. What's your request? Even half of the kingdom will be granted. And Esther replied, my petition, my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant me my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet that I will prepare for them. I will answer your question. Esther could have half the kingdom. I mean, if you think about it, I taught two weeks ago that she came from the bottom to the top. She came from nothing to be queen, and now she's being offered half the kingdom. And it's in these moments, right, where you see what it is you really want. When someone offers you something that the rest of the world says you should have, gold and riches, fame. And she said, but that's not what I want. Now, you juxtapose this to the second character in this story. You already know he's a villain because I told you he was, but let me sort of, sort of point out this character, Haman. 
Because honestly, what you see in Haman is a different heart's desire. One of power and recognition, one of money and prestige. This is a man who wants to be seen by people in high regard. I think you could say he's bought into the lies of his culture, that if you have more stuff, you'll be more important. And this is what Haman believes. It is his heart's desire. It, it is at the center of his story. And so it tells us in Esther 5, verse 9, that Haman then, he goes out happy and in high spirits. He goes out happy and in high spirits. Why? Because he's been invited to this banquet. And nobody else has. It's just him and the king. This is at the center of his desire, but it's interesting. It says that when he sees Mordecai, this is still in verse 9, when he sees Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he is filled with rage against Mordecai. There's something about the wrong desires is that they never can really fill you up, right? When we really want things that the world tells us we should have and then we grab them, it seems like they're never enough. Can't have enough money, can't have enough fame, can't have enough influence. I mean, this man just got invited to an exclusive banquet and one dude, one fellow, one thing happens and he can't deal with it. Bible tells us that he does boast about his wealth, his many sons. This is in verse 11. How the king has honored him in verse 12. He said, that's not all. He's, he says, I'm the only person. Esther's invited to accompany the king to the banquet that she gave, and she's invited me tomorrow, but it all gives me no satisfaction. It gives me no satisfaction. Because I see that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gate. He tells his wife this, his family, and his wife says, well, then do something about it. Well, what should I do, he says. Put a stake in the middle of town and then go to the king tomorrow at the banquet and ask to put that man you don't like on that stake. Let's end him. He says, well, that's a great idea. Two different stories. Now, chapter 6 cuts over to the king. At the beginning of chapter 6, the banquet is over, and the king goes off to bed. And he can't sleep. And in those days, he didn't have Ambien. So he calls for the next best thing. He said, can you bring me the, the scrolls that talk about my reign? I'll read through this, and it will make me sleepy. And so he starts to read through this scroll of all the things that had happened in his kingdom, and he comes across something very interesting. He is reminded of what Mordecai had done for him. Remember Mordecai in chapter two, I taught about it two weeks ago, that Mordecai had saved him from an assassination attempt. You know what's interesting sometimes, folks? Isn't it interesting that sometimes we do the right thing and we don't get rewarded for it? Have you ever been in that situation? where you feel like you did the right thing. You stood up for the right thing. This is Mordecai's story. In chapter two, at his peril, he stands up and does the right thing, and nothing happens. And remember, two weeks ago, we said, isn't sometimes the fingerprint of God like that? That he's at work all the time around us, but sometimes we don't see or can't comprehend what it is exactly he's doing until, I don't know, later, well, this is the story. In chapter 3, or in chapter 6, verse 3, the king says, Okay, so then what honor and recognition has Mordecai received for this? The king asked. Nothing has been done for him. His attendant answered. The king's like, oh. Oh. Well, that guy did the right thing. We ought to do something for him. So he has this idea. Who should I ask about what we should do? My right-hand guy, Haman. So he calls Haman up. He says, Haman, I need you to come here. Haman comes in and he asks him, what should we do for someone that the king would like to offer? And this is Haman. Now you see his heart's desire because Haman thinks he's talking about him. He's like, oh, 
this is my chance to get all the stuff that I desire. Like the king just asked, what should I do for someone that I really like, that's done really good for my kingdom? And look what Haman says in verse 7. He says, well, for the man the king delights to honor, I don't know, king, have them bring a royal robe to the king that the king has worn, and a horse the king has ridden, one with a royal crest, Placed on his head, I mean, Haman's really going for it, right? He's like, I'm going to go ahead and milk this for all it's worth. He said, then, then in verse 9, he said, let the robe and the horse be entrusted to the one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on a horse through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights in. He says, honor this guy. Give him what he wants. And in verse 10, after thinking about it, the king says, well, then go at once. Get the robe and the horse. Do just as you suggested for Mordecai the Jew. <laughs> Haman's like, what? You know, here's what's interesting. And it, it just spoke to me all week long as I was studying this passage about story. Here's the truth. Everybody, not just these two, all of you, you're, you're living a story. Like, your life is a story. And so I'm wondering, if you had the choice right now to pick anybody in the world to play you in the story of your life, who would you pick? Well, I know who I would pick. No, I, I don't know. Um, maybe that's not exactly my doppelganger, but here's the reality. When we think about the stories of our lives, when we think about stories that we truly admire, if someone really was playing you in the story of your life, here's the real question. How would that character have to act in order for you to admire that character? Like if somebody was playing you in the story of your life, how would that pe person have to show up in your story? What would their posture have to be? I think if I were to phrase it differently, what would they desire? What would they really want? Because remember, every great story is about a hero, a character, ultimately pursuing the thing that they want. And if your life is a story, the real question is, what then do you really, really want? John Ortberg says this about story and characters that we admire. He says, you know what matters most of all to us in a story? It isn't so much what happens to a character. It is how the character responds to what happens. We long for characters we admire. So what kind of story are you living? And if you were to see your story on a screen... Would it be a story that you really want to tell? I want to talk to dads for just a minute. Because I know the pressure of being a father. Like, I was 23 when our first child came into the world. And I went from sort of feeling no pressure at all to now feeling like, oh my gosh, I got to keep that thing alive, right? <laughs> I got to feed it and change it. I mean, I didn't feed it, and I didn't change it as much. But you know what I'm saying. We all feel like we wake up one day, and the pressure of this world sits on our shoulders, and then we begin to sometimes write the stories of our lives. Well, if I have more money, and if I get more stuff, and if we have the right house, and if the lawn's the right size, right? We begin to just live our lives chasing these things, and then we stop oftentimes somewhere down the road and we look at the story of our life and we go, now wait a minute. 
is this really the story I want to live? Is there's more to life than this? Than money, the job, the fame, the house, comfort. You know, oftentimes our stories get derailed because we want the wrong things. I mean, if it's true that our stories are all predicated on what we desire, you can sort of say, well, if our stories get off track, it's because we want the wrong things. And and it's interesting because I thought a lot about like, well, how is it that we as humans so often get off track? Why is that? And there is sort of a couple of reasons. There's an interesting experiment that was done some years ago to sort of illustrate how we get off track when it comes to the things that we want. And, and uh, researchers were offering people this concept. They, they would say, I'll give you $100 today or $150 a year from now. Well, almost all the people who were given that option take the $100 today. And this is called a temporal discounting, right? It's a discount We discount the value of having something far off in the future compared to having something now. I do it all the time because I will discount the fact that eating another Yolanda's chicken nachos right this minute, I want that. I don't think about the cholesterol it's building in my heart, right? We, We often do this. We would rather be right in an argument then think about how it might affect a, a friendship or a relationship in a week or a month or a year. We would rather have what's in front of us than to have a bit of discipline to get something better down the road. And this is a, at the heart of many of our broken stories. They're really just wrong desires. I mean, and it's not just like this idea of a temporal discounting. The truth is we are bombarded on a, from a consistent basis telling us what we ought to desire, right? Like there's a whole industry that puts stuff on television, puts it on a phone. They put it in billboards to tell you, you know, if you buy this shirt, you'll be a better human being, right? Right? Or if you buy that car, or get that house, or have this money, if we accumulate this stuff, if we chase and build our story on these things, someday you'll wake up and go, oh my goodness, it's the exact story I wanted. But, you know, honestly, how many things have you really, really desired that you bought, and at the end of it, you felt like, oh, well, now I've arrived? I mean, it's rare. The shirt that you had to have, right? Right? ends up in the bottom of a drawer somewhere. And now it's just clutter and it creates more work because you got to box it up and take it to a donation center, right? We have storage industries where we take all the things that we have that at one point in our life we were convinced we had to have. Me too. So let me just ask you again. What do you really want? Jesus says something about this in Matthew chapter 6. I love it. He says, listen, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where the moths and the vermins destroy it, right? And where thieves break in and steal it. See, this, this begs this question. What is your heart's desire? I mean, this matters more than anything else because if your life is a story and the spine of your story is about achieving your heart's desire, then wrestling down this desire is the most important thing you can do. If you want to change your story, then you have to change what you want. And I know what some of us think. You're like, well, that's not how it works. You can't just change what I want. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Yes, you can. You can change your mind. We do it all the time. When I was nine years old, it's interesting. I was thinking about this the other night. So I literally make the world's best guacamole. (laughs) It's amazing. Uh, Unbelievable. And um, I I could eat it for every meal. And if you tasted it, you could too. (laughs) Uh, 
But here's the interesting thing about this guacamole that I love. I thought back to like when I was nine years old and I was physically repulsed by guacamole. <laughs> Anybody else? Like when you're a kid, you're like, ooh, gross, it's green and it has chunks of onion in it. Oh, right? It sounds awful. And then somewhere along the, the way, I tasted it and you know what I did? I changed my mind. We do this all the time. We change our mind. You want to change your story? Change your mind. Desire something different. And I know some of you are like, well, it's too late. It's too late. My story's already busted. I've already messed it up. My kids don't, they're not, it's not what I want it to be. I've already busted up my relationship. Listen, there is no story that can't be redeemed. But I will tell you, if you want to change your story, you have to change your heart's desire. It's that simple. You want to change your story? Change what you desire. Change what you want. You're like, for real? Oh, no, that's it. You want to change your story? Change what you want. I have learned this in the journey of life. that We don't always get the stories that we want. Sometimes there's a lot of ups and downs along the way. And that oftentimes we will desire the wrong things and start off on the first few chapters of the story of our lives. And then sometimes we get to these moments where we go, but, but can my story be fixed and healed? And I'm beginning to understand more than ever that if you really want to fix a broken story, you really need to make it part of a better story. Like, like a, a, a grander story, a bigger story. I mean, if you are somebody who says, I don't know the story that I'm living right now is the one I want to live until the end of my days, you're in good company. These, there are stories littered in the Bible of people in that very scenario. People who had a story and then somewhere along the way decided, I want a better story. I want to want something different. I mean, it, in the Bible, they actually change their name when their story switches over, right? You had Abram, he then becomes Abraham and he becomes the father of many people. You had Jacob, the deceiver, he then enters into this new story, he becomes Israel. You go to the New Testament, you had Simon and his heart's desire was to be a great fisherman. Then he meets Jesus, his name is changed to Peter and he becomes the rock. There are stories throughout scripture of people who don't like their story and so they attach themselves to a new story. They want something new, they desire something different. Saul hated Christians. His heart's desire was to eliminate this radical sect and then he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus and his story gets changed. And now his heart's desire, his story is just a reflection of what he desires. And he said, what does he desire? Let me tell you, he writes it in Galatians 2 and he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. He's saying all that old things I desire, they're gone. My new desire, Christ lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's life can be summed up this way. His life becomes the story of Jesus. You want to change your story? Change what you want. Rick Warren writes this in the opening lines of his book, The Purpose Driven Life. Do you know what the purpose of your life? It's far greater than your fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It is far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you wanna know why you were placed on this planet, in other words, what your real story is, you must begin with God. You were born by his purpose, for his purpose a greater story. What do you desire more than anything else? What I've become, become so acutely aware of is what I really want, is that my small little story, Eric James Parks novel gets attached to something 
bigger than me. And our stories can be healed and fixed when we attach to this greater story. And this is the great invitation that we can attach ourselves to Jesus' story. I love what Dallas Willard, the theologian, says. He says, you know the aim of God in history is the creation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons. Listen, with him included in that community as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. Do, do, you know what, do you know what God really desires? I mean, think about it. Here's the real hero of the grand story. And what is it that God desires more than anything else? Well, you can see it in the way that the story plays out. That God wants so desperately to be near his rebellious creation that he would do whatever it took. Even sending his own son to suffer and die at the hands of that creation. But that wasn't the end of the story. Jesus would suffer and he would die. But then he would be put in a grave, raise himself from the grave, beginning the rewriting of the story of death and hell and the grave, and in the process giving you and me a chance at a brand new story of redemption. And all we have to do is accept it, to step into this new story, to say, my story is filled with potholes and sin and grossness, and I can attach myself to Jesus' story. He says, yes, no matter who you are or what you've written, you can come in. This grand story of redemption was written for you so that you could come back home to God. When you came in tonight, you were given one of these. Will you pull it out? This is a communion element. If you didn't receive a communion element, we have ushers that are coming down the aisle and they'd love to grab you one. Just hold up your hand and here's what we say. Um, here at Plum Creek, we invite any follower of Jesus to participate. Doesn't matter if you're a member at some other church or what denomination you grew up in, we ask you, we invite you to participate in this sacrament. But let me tell you why this matters so much. Because communion reminds us of this story. This grand story that Jesus took on his shoulders reminds us of what God was willing to do, what he desired more than anything else, a relationship with us. And it reminds us his heart's desire toward us. And this is why when Jesus met with his disciples on that night and he took for the very first communion and he said these words to them. He said, now, as they were eating, Jesus took this bread and after he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. If you will, there's a little tab you can pull out your bread. Will you put it in your hand? Jesus says this. He says, now take, eat, this is my body. Let's take the, the bread. And then in like manner, he took the cup. This was the cup of redemption. And when he had given thanks for it, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of it, all for you. But this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take the cup together. Will you pray with me, Father? We are grateful for the work that you did on the cross for the story that you were willing to rewrite on our behalf. God, we are so grateful that your heart's desire was a relationship with us to bring us back into communion with you. 
and that you were willing to do whatever it took. And so, Father, as we remember this gift, we invite you into our story to help us rewrite our desires, to pursue the things that matter more than anything else, and that is you, Jesus. May you remind us that our stories are not done. Pray these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.